Uh, our next speaker is Sarah Iceland. She is uh, recently appointed in January as the president of the Boston, of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation in here in Massachusetts. Uh, she's the former commissioner of the Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy for the Commonwealth. And uh, she was chief of staff before that for healthcare services at the Blues. Sarah? Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, and I'm going to kind of pick up uh, trying to talk uh, mostly about Massachusetts in terms of uh, we made an explicit decision in this state to really work on coverage and access first, um, but always knew that the next conversation that we were going to have in, in this community was really about how do we slow the growth in health spending and how do we continue to improve on the quality of the terrific health care system that we have in Massachusetts. Um, but even uh, those who are among the best can, can get better. And so I'm going to quote Brian, who I think had a great line earlier tonight about as we think about what we did in Massachusetts and we look at the National Reform Bill, I think both of them were just enormous leaps forward in terms of really extending uh, health insurance coverage to um, to almost everyone in our state and to almost everyone in the nation. And we're sort of smaller steps forward in terms of uh, really addressing some of our um, pretty profound challenges in terms of the rapidly escalating growth in health spending. And so would expect that in the same way that now that we're four years into implementing coverage expansions in Massachusetts and are really now um, turning our attention to conversations about uh, delivery system accountability, about affordability of health care, um, would expect to see the same thing play out in the national conversation. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the provisions. There's some really great opportunities in the national reform law um, to do some pilots and demos and, and other things. Um, but I think we'll be hearing a lot more about this as we move forward. So. Um, uh, because Brian started with a, a beautiful um, graphic, I thought I, I should too. <laughs> and this one I borrowed from our colleague Nancy Turnbull, who's sort of the source of many, many great graphics, who is also the source of that wonderful Calder Mobile describing health reform in Massachusetts. Um, but I thought this slide and the kind of metaphor of Sisyphus was really perfect to talk about the challenge of tackling the growth in healthcare costs or healthcare spending for a couple of reasons. One, because this is really hard. So if we think coverage, the politics of coverage and getting that done is a heavy lift, the politics of really talking about changing the way we finance our healthcare system um, is really even harder and more complicated given that this is such a huge, huge portion of the economy and an enormous portion particularly as we talk about it in Massachusetts um, here. Uh, on the other hand, I, I also um, think that in the same way that we have shown such tremendous leadership and really a model for the nation around how do you, how do you tackle coverage, I think the level of conversations that are happening in this state right now about healthcare spending and about solutions to really tackle um, health spending offer a great amount of promise to again have us hopefully lead the way um, in this state on this, on this frontier as well. Um, I also think this is a great slide because I want to take this opportunity to do a little myth busting. Um, I think when you look at this slide, um, you could interpret this as saying, okay, the people who are really looking at Massachusetts and saying health reform and the cost of health reform are really, you know, budget busters and, and driving up uh, state spending and hurting the economy. Um, it's, it's really actually, um, it's not true. When we really look at what we've spent in health reform in Massachusetts, and compare it to what we expected to spend back when this law was done in 2006, we're really about where we expected to be. Um, the challenge, of course, is uh, we've had, uh, we're in a major economic recession and our safety net programs, the demand on our safety net programs is greater as people have lost jobs. That's not really about health reform. That's about many, many more complex factors. It's also about the fact that um, health spending continues to grow at a rate that outpaces the growth in wages, the growth in the economy, and so um, as that trend continues, um, it, poses, it poses real challenges for all of us, um, not just in terms of state dollars and the state costs of health reform, but also, as Brian pointed out, um, over a third of the folks who have signed up for coverage since we did health reform in Massachusetts have signed up for private coverage. 
Um, so this isn't just about state dollars and state costs. It's also about getting handle on the growth and spending so that health care re remains affordable for everybody um, in this state. And, and important to point out is if we continue on this same kind of trajectory, the more we spend on health care, um, the less we have available to spend on other things um, as a society and within state government, limited state government resources, um, many of which we know um, can actually be more important to determining the ultimate health of a population even than having health insurance cards, so housing food, education. I mean, these things are all really profound um, social determinants of health. So there are a whole lot of reasons why we need to get a handle on health spending. But the main point I wanted to leave you with is we knew from the beginning um, as we headed down this health reform path that we would be having this conversation now. And we made an explicit decision to really work on coverage first. And so now's the time that we're having this, uh, that we're having this, this next conversation. And frankly, we've now got everybody so collectively invested in our success, I think we're better teed up to tackle this next phase now than we ever would have been before. Um, so just a few charts to sort of emphasize this point more. Um, yeah, we're particularly challenged in Massachusetts because while the um, uh, United States has the somewhat um, dubious distinction of being the highest spending country in the world in terms of per person spending on health care, we actually spend the most um, of any state here in Massachusetts. So. Uh, this state spends more than uh, per person on health care than, really, than anywhere in the world. Um, so thus my kind of point about it being a, a particular challenge for us. And this, this next slide is a Massachusetts slide, but it looks the same uh, for when, if you look at the nation as a whole. If we continue on this trajectory, what we spend today will double uh, over the next 10 years um, if, we don't, if we don't get a handle on this. Um, so, so as we think about, because uh, I intended to talk a little bit about cost, but also about quality, um, we have a phenomenal health care delivery system here in Massachusetts. And we have a phenomenal system in the US. But we could do better. Um, we know that um, you know, adults, fewer than half adults, and these are Massachusetts statistics, are getting recommended preventive and screening care, that fewer than half of adult diabetics are getting recommended preventive care. Um, we've got a lot of use of our health care system, preventable emergency department visits, preventable hospitalizations, preventable readmissions, so people who are sent home home but end up back in the hospital. And these are all quality improvement opportunities but that have really significant financial and health spending implications. So if we can make progress on some of these quality fronts, we're also going to be able to save a really significant amount of money. And the estimates, um, these are just some Massachusetts specific data, but just to give you a sense of scale, there's some overlap in these numbers. But you know, there's at least, uh, I think conservatively, a billion dollar opportunity in this state if we can make progress on these areas, just looking at preventable emergency department visits, so if we can really get people um, seen in doctor's offices on these preventable hospitalizations and readmissions. So um, great. Except nurses offices. Too. Absolutely. I think one of the things that we're really having an engaged conversation about is um, scope of practice. So how do we build delivery models that are the most efficient? Um, how do we make sure that we're really um, taking advantage of um, the system and thinking differently about the structures and the way that things are organized or even the rules in terms of what different parts of health professions um, can do right now. And there's actually a lot that we can do at the state level. Um, there are, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the changes that, that have been made and that I think are coming as a result of these conversations, so absolutely. Um, so healthcare reform, Chapter 58, the law that we were talking about in Massachusetts, you know, did contemplate and knew that we needed to make progress in some of these things. So um, established a quality and cost council. The, the quality and cost council has launched a consumer website that puts out new information that allows consumers to compare quality and cost. It's very hospital focused right now. Um, it has developed uh, as a result of a multi-year conversation um, uh, what they've referred to as a roadmap to cost containment with a range of um, almost a couple of dozen different ideas about how do we really get it, how, what, are the, what are the options to really get a handle on this and some concrete recommendations for moving forward. Uh, but that, it didn't stop with Chapter 58. So last uh, couple, gosh, it's been a, a year and a half. Uh, or almost longer, uh, uh, originating in our Senate President's office, uh, uh, another law, um, sort of dubbed by some as Health Reform II, was passed that had 50 different sections. I'm just going to highlight a few. 
um, one of which charged a 10-person commission to work over six months to really look at how we pay for health care. Um, because there's really a growing consensus in our community and nationally that the fee-for-service system, the system by which every time we do something in healthcare we get paid, has really created financial incentives to do more and to do more high cost, high intervention things that tend to pay better or um, pay at higher margins and that that may not in fact be really what we need um, to really provide a financial incentive to, to work on uh, eliminating all of those preventable, um, those, those opportunities to uh, you know, keep people out of the hospital um, because there aren't rewards in the system for, for doing that right now. In fact, as providers, um, it, that's actually a penalty because that's revenue if you keep someone out of the hospital, that's a DRG you don't, that you don't get. Um, so recognizing the need to really look at that and think about that differently. Um, we now live in a state, and I think we'll see more and more of this at the national level, um, with virtually, I would say, full and complete transparency, um, even over the course of the last month. Um, we now know, if you really want to dig in and look, what every health insurer pays to every hospital and physician group in this state. I mean, a level of transparency that really um, does not exist anywhere else. Eh, maybe New Hampshire kind of beat us a little bit, but uh, not, not quite at the level that's out there now. So there are annual hearings. You may have seen some of the media coverage about these. They actually wrapped up la last week um, and reports. Um, so a big engaged conversation about this. And, and there were uh, other, other provisions. Um, so I just wanted to pause for one minute because I think one of the really significant recommendations and another way in which Massachusetts is, I think, uh, setting an example in terms of a, a building consensus around changes is in this area of payment reform. And when we look at the national um, law, we see a lot of opportunities and signals that the, fed the federal government and Medicare is kind of heading in the same direction. So there are some really wonderful new opportunities for pilots and uh, kind of innovations in the area of changing the way we pay um, with the intent to uh, uh, invest, learn, and then spread these models quickly. So sometimes at the federal level, we see these things set up as demonstration projects where you do them for five years, you evaluate them for five years, and then maybe you grow them, maybe you don't. I think all the signals are to move, move a lot faster. Um, so in our state, I think uh, pretty uh, unusually, we were able to, over the course of this commission that was created in the bill that I mentioned, um, come to a unanimous set of recommendations for where do we go, what, what, do we, what do we think we should replace this existing fee-for-service system with. And the fact that we had this um, multi-stakeholder commission that met over six months that included um, representative of hospitals, of physicians, of state government, of payers. Um, I will say we did not have uh, everyone at the table, um, but made a real effort to go out and chat with folks all across Massachusetts. I think we did about 50 different stakeholder meetings over the course of this commission to make sure that we were get really getting the voices of, of nurses, of people who were not represented, um, to bring back to this commission to talk about where we go from here. But we essentially made a, a unanimous recommendation that we should move away from our fee-for-service system and move toward a system of what um, we referred to as global payments. So really being a payment um, per person, per patient, per member on an annual basis that would encompass all of the costs of care that could be predicted that a patient would need. Um, so that then if a system was coming together to really uh, coordinate care across you know, all, uh, all of the different parts of the system, so hospitals and specialists and primary care and home health and rehab facilities and you know, all of the parts of the system, if, if, there were, uh, if they were successful in meeting quality goals, care coordination goals, and, and could keep people healthier and keep people out of the hospital, there would be a financial benefit to the delivery system for having achieved that success. So I'm not going to go into too much um, detail about this. There's a, um, in some ways, it's sort of a capitation imp 